All right. Uh, this is February uh, 16th, Senate Judiciary. The issue is the miscellaneous cannabis regulation bill. We have uh, uh, Michelle Childs from Legislative Council to walk us through the bill. Um, unfortunately, Senator Bunning is not available right now um, to report hearings. So go ahead, Michelle, please. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I was I have a couple things to go over with you. There's the there's S25 is introduced, but also I wanted to uh, give you a little refresher about the timeline uh, for uh, for the canifer that's rolling out because as you know, there's a lot of stuff that's kind of front loaded that has to happen and um, and think of, so you'll see the timeline. And then also I wanted to just go over section five from uh, act 164 that has all these reporting requirements because you're supposed to receive a bunch of information from the control board um, so that you can act during this legislative year. So 25 might be a vehicle for that. And, but as everybody knows, there's some issues around the timing and, and whether or not that's actually doable at this point because of, of the late start. Um, so, um, so I'm gonna start out with the timeline, if that's so, is that okay with you, Senator Sears? Hope you're muted, Dick. I'm, uh, that's fine, thank okay. you. All right. Um, so let's see. Oops, that's showing something that shouldn't be there. Sorry. Don't have the, hold on one second. Sorry about that. It's my fault. But I had the timeline up. Hmm. Does that show up for y'all? Yep. Okay, great. So I'll just buzz through and I'll just show you the beginning part because that's what's important. So um, I think everybody already knows um, the, the governor uh, did not act on the bill immediately. And so um, the, everything's kind of probably maybe a couple months behind. Um, so he had the, they, the, the governor's office had the application period open for applying to the, to the administration for the first pass. Um, had that open till the end of 2020. And so then, and then we, since we have uh, Senator White here, she can fill you in on the work of the nominating board, but the nominating board has been didn't receive the names for quite a while into 2021, but they've been working really hard. And my understanding is they they did um, wrap up their, just wrap up all their interviews. I don't know how you got through all of those in such a short amount of time. Um, so those names have been sent to the governor and just a little refresher on the process is it's that the governor advertises, collects names, sends names that he is interested in to the nominating committee, the nominating committee interviews and vets those candidates and then sends back to the governor the names of those applicants who the committee feels are well qualified for the position. Do you want, do you want me to just say what we've done now to get that out of the way? Senator Sears? I don't care. <laughs> yeah, Wait, sure. So, uh, so 94 people applied. The governor whittled it down to, I think it was 48 and sent us 48 names. We interviewed um, 14 and his letter said that he wanted nine people submitted to him. Well, he said three for each position, but we had a difference of how you do that math. And um, we sent him 10 names yesterday. Okay. And, and we urged him to act speedily. Jeanette? Yes. Um, so you sent him 10 names and there are nine that get selected? No, three. Oh, I'm sorry, three, okay. He asked us to send him nine, at least nine names. Okay, and it's three ultimately. Yeah, it's three, it's a chair and two board members. So I will, um, I'll, I'll double check. I thought that 
and, and maybe that maybe that got changed at the end. And I don't recall, there's so many different versions, but my recollection was that um, there had to be five names per position. But um, but that may let me I'll go back and look at the language. Well, we did not do that. Um, we sent. What did you say, Michelle? How many? I thought it was five names per position, but that might have been. I'll, I'll let me look at it. I don't want to take up time, but I'll. I'll, I'll well, check. he he asked in his letter for three names, at least three names for each position, and we sent him ten. So, okay. Um. So, uh, board members were supposed to have started their terms on January nineteenth. Um, and then in February would have been uh, interviewing and hiring for the executive director and assistant position. So um, there'd be a team of five. Um, and, uh, and then January and March was the time for developing um, a number of, uh, of proposals for coming back to the legislature. So um, I'm going <laughs> to go through, can you see this uh, 164 at the top, it says section five. Yeah. So I'm just gonna go through that. This is what the board was is supposed to be working on right now in terms of reporting back to the General Assembly for you to be able to take action on this year. The first one being the resources necessary implementation for the second and third year rollout of, of uh, the program, including positions and funding. The next one is the state fees to be charged and collected by the board. You recall that um, there wasn't a specific fee structure set out in the board. There's like, it identifies what types of fees have to be collected, but it's up to the board to make recommendations to the General Assembly, um, what those dollar amounts should be, how many tiers there should be, how it should be all broken down. And as you well know, it's the legislature's job to be setting the fees, not the administration. And so that's something where um, there's kind of a, a little issue from a timing standpoint of how does that get done now with the delay in the board. Um, third one is whether money is expected to be generated by the state fees are sufficient to support the duties of the board, because recall that the, uh, the board is supported by fees going into the Cannabis Regulation Fund, and the taxes um, are designated to go somewhere else, either to general fund or to substance misuse prevention or with the sales tax going to after school or summer programming. So those are something else. Those, th those taxes don't support running the board, but there is a process to backfill the fund for running the board from taxes if there isn't enough revenue. So they're supposed to report on that. They're also to report to you on the local fees to be charged and collected. And y'all know that issue very well. Um, the, the idea is that instead of a local option tax, what was agreed to in conference committee was that there would be state assessed local fees that would then be um, distributed back to towns that host a cannabis establishment according to some type of formula. So they have to report on that. They also have to recommend specific criteria um, or additional requirements for uh, environmental land use law um, and how those would apply to cannabis establishments. And they have to do the same thing with regard to energy or efficiency requirements or standards for cannabis establishments. Then you'll recall, uh, oh, actually there's one more here before advertising. Um, they also have to recommend whether cannabis product manufacturers and dispensaries should be considered food manufacturing establishments or food processors, um, which are currently regulated by the Department of Health. They are currently not regulated. The dispensaries and the production of food items is not regulated by Department of Health. They've kind of begged off of that and didn't want to do that. Um, and so that they, the control board is supposed to recommend whether or not to require that. And then the final thing is the advertising. So as you know, last year at the end during, um, so the House had passed a complete ban on advertising. Um, the Senate had concerns about constitutionality. And so um, the board is tasked with working with the Attorney General's office to come back to you uh, and uh, pro provide a proposal 
um, for regulating advertising um, short of a complete ban um, that would take into consideration constitutional protections, um, but also not going in at and promoting the use of cannabis. So all of those things that I just went through, um, that's all information that was supposed to come to the legislature by July, I mean, by April 1st. Um, and so ostensibly so that you could get that information, receive that information and take action on it. Um, obviously the things that, that, that are critical would be, um, and I guess maybe they're all critical because they're, they're in here and they're gonna be developing regulations over the next year. Um, so that they can start accepting applications at the beginning of 2022. But um, you can't really function, obviously, if there's no, if they don't have the fees established. Um, so there's that one, I think, is really kind of, I don't, you know, that's the legislature's going to have to figure out how to, how they want to deal with that. And then the advertising issue is that um, if nothing is done, there's nothing in the act at all regulating advertising, which I don't think was anybody's um, hope. Uh, it was just a disagreement on how you regulate advertising. So if nothing is done this session on advertising, uh, you know, there's, we can look at when you want to talk about this stuff, and I don't want to detract from S25 this morning, but, uh, you know, we can look at some options of how to, how to do that. Um, because I think we're going to have to figure out how does the legislature get its work done if you're not in session. Uh, Michelle? Yep. Is it possible um worst case scenario we don't do anything on advertising is it possible for the control board to pass a rule a temporary rule against advertising given that they control the like license a ban yes um making it clear that it's a moratorium until the legislature acts let me think about that the board can pass rules around stuff like that. And um, let me just let me just think a little bit about how that would work and the timing of everything. And yep. the issue is is one that because you because you have to think about the legality, but you also have to think about the practicality of things and how and how does it work or does it not work. And so I would just want a little time to think through that in terms of how uh, of the rulemaking and then also how that would impact people who are applicants who are um, applying for licenses and probably for some dishing out a lot of money and not really knowing what the playing field is. Uh, yeah, the reason I ask is because it, given the history, it doesn't seem impossible that we could reach an impasse with the house on advertising, agree on everything else, um, and not wind up being able to figure that piece out. Um, so if, if as a, as a fail safe, the board could prohibit advertising, you know, until the legislature is able to deal with it. I, I just, I wouldn't want a, a wild west scenario where there's a year where these operations could download a lot of advertising and poison the well with, uh, with people who don't want the advertising, if that makes sense. Sure. No, no, I understand. There's um, there's high stakes for any any way you turn on it. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, so I just so that's it. I just go over those things. Um, so does anybody else have any other questions about that, about timeline, or about all the things that all the information that has to not, come to you? Not really. Um, I right. think you know. It is what it is. Uh, if there's something that we need to do in this bill to help with the advertising, I think we should do it. So Senator Peruth just. Senator Sears, can I jump in for a second? Sure. I was supposed to be in a court hearing at 9.30 this morning. The court is not open yet. And I'm going to be here for a little while, but I'm anticipating being yanked off to try to get my guy out of jail. So I just wanted to give you a heads up. If I disappear, that's where I've gone to. Okay. Well, I don't. I wish there was a way I could help you with that. 
I wish there was too. I got a whole lot of files I'd like to have you help me with. <laughs> yeah, my own. I it's think we all have our issues today. It is often. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, you know, the court particularly, but that's for Friday. Yep. All right. Senator Sears, may I ask Michelle uh, a question about the timeline? Senator White has a question. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm looking at this timeline, and we um, didn't have we didn't have any proposals. Even even had the timeline been kept too, and we were not two months behind, which is what we are now, two months behind. We didn't have reports coming to the legislature until April first. How on earth did we think we would get anything done from April? till may because it would have to go through both houses how did we how did we think we were going to do that i don't think that's a question michelle should try to answer it it wasn't a quite actually it wasn't a question for michelle it was a question on michelle's um timeline i misspoke here but how did do, do you remember do, does anybody remember how we thought we were going to do that i think we were being the first media conference in COVID times, trying to settle with a house that didn't want to budge on anything. Okay, I just, <clears throat> okay. That's my recollection. Senator Benning may have a different one. Okay. I mean, it is, we did what we did. And if it needs correcting, this is uh, obviously the bill to try to correct anything. And I think that, you know, one of the governor's complaints was the time limit. It is um, non signing a statement. I think, um, Senator White, if I do, I would just say is that because of the long legislative session last year, because um, cannabis, you know, kind of stalled in the House and then and then wasn't able to get resolved until the fall, and my recollection was y'all didn't want to wait another year to put it off and we're trying to see if you could still stick with having an open market by 2022. And we discussed that and everybody knew it was really tight, but um, we're, folks seem to be hopeful that if everybody were together, you could try and get it done. So, um, so I'm gonna move to S25 uh, as introduced. Um, so starting with section one, so this is an amendment to the, uh, the local government section. And so you'll recall that what was settled on last year during in conference was opt in for retail sales. Um, so all other cannabis establishments, so whether you're talking about cultivation and product manufacturer, testing lab, wholesaler, those do not need buy-in or an affirmative vote from the town prior to them being able to operate. They wouldn't still need a state license. And if the town decides to issue local licenses, they would need that local license and need to be in compliance with all the town's local rules. Um, but they would not need to have the vote. Um, but the vote would be required for uh, if you're going to have retailers or integrated licensees. And remember, integrated licenses are just for uh, the five existing dispensaries could get an integrated license. Um, as part of that integrated license, they could have one retail point of sale to the public, only one, just like with the other licenses. Um, but there seems to be um, some confusion about 
we added in the integrated kind of at the end there, and there seems to be some confusion. Is it apply to the whole integrated operation or just where they're meeting the public and serving the public? And the intention was that it's just the retail portion. It's not like the whole thing. So that if the integrated, like right now, dispensaries, some dispensaries, they may have their grow facility in one location, but where they actually serve patients is in another location. Um, and so the intention was that this would be the same and that a subsection A would only apply to retail sales, whether it's by a retailer or, the, or an integrated. And so that's the, the clarifying language on line 10 around there. Michelle? Yep. Um, so could someone with an integrated license have one point of sale, but multiple points of growing, let's say? No. Only one of each? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Yep. And then the second portion that's that's addressed, the second thing that's addressed in this section is the idea of having all towns vote at a certain time on the issue of retail sales. So this kind of harkens back to uh, in the late 60s, this was done with alcohol. It used to be that towns would vote every year on whether or not they were going to have alcohol sales. And then there was... Um, something put into statute that said, well, as of, you know, whatever that particular date was, that's going to be, that's going to hold for the towns unless they put it up for a vote and reverse it and change it. And so I'll let Senator, if Senator Benning wants to address that, that was something he was particularly interested in is having a set question for all towns to get everybody on the same page so that everybody kind of knows the landscape and which towns are permitting retail sales and which towns are not permitting retail sales that date coincides with when uh, people will start applying for licenses. So um, I don't know if you want me to just keep walking through and people talk. Yeah, please. If somebody okay. has a question, they know how to. Okay. Alice, I have a question. Is okay. there- Where are you? I'm on, still on that same paragraph, line 17 on page two. I just wanna know, is integrated licenses, licensees uh, defined in this bill someplace? Yes. It, well, not in this bill, in the underlying law. Um, I can send it to you, but essentially what it is, is the, the new system allows for um, five, six types of licenses. That's okay. You can, you can just send it to me. I'm just thinking. The integrated incorporates all of them and it okay. allows them to be vertically integrated. But for an integrated license, you can only have one. Okay. I'm just trying to prepare for a question from constituents as well, and they see it only sure. in the bill, so it's not a definition that's here. Sure. Mich okay. Michelle, Michelle, yep. Michelle mm -hmm. the integrated licensees, can you scroll that? Thank you. Um, shouldn't we clarify that that be integrated licensees with a retail license for sale? Um, I don't know if I so on, on line 10, you've done a good job at, at distinguishing that there is a retail portion of an integrated license, but the question being placed on the ballot could be confusing because you're talking about an integrated licensee. If they don't have a retail license, are we not suggesting in the absence of clarifying language that somebody with an integrated license that does not include retail would then be permitted to sell to adults? I'm just thinking it might be- um, Wait, say that last statement again? Sure. The integrated licensees who don't have a retail license You've now got the, the language on the ballot that asks whether or not those people who don't have a retail license would be permitted to sell cannabis to adults. But, but, in corp, but as part of an integrated license, one of the things you can do under an integrated license is sell to retail. So all, all integrated licensees have the ability to sell retail. Yes. I, I, I you think don't have, you don't have a separate retailer license. It's 
it's included in that one license. But I think Joe has a point here. If I'm a town's person looking at this on my ballot, I don't have a clue what it means. Yeah. And I, I think that we need to reword that. Not not the concept of it, but the rewording of it so that people I mean, who are voting on it know what they're voting. Well, on. can I can I ask, is there a need to say anything other than licensed cannabis retailers? Because an integrated licensee is a licensed cannabis retailer. Yeah. Mm, it does it's not technically, it's its own it's its own license that allows retail sales. A retailer, cannabis retailer is defined some, as something different. I would suggest if you wanna- uh, I'm, I'm hearing two that. different, I'm hearing two different things from you, Michelle. Uh, look. Integrated licensees all have a retail license. No, they don't have, it's, it's not that they have, it's that they can do under the integrated license the same as all five of the other kind. They don't possess a separate retail license. I think we've got think to we define can, that somehow. It, it's, I, it is defined in the existing. I, I, I think that okay, um, I, we're spending you know, we're, too much time on this. We can come up with language to make it clear. I agree with Senator White. Okay. Also, all you have to do on line 17 and 18 is just say, shall licensed cannabis establishments but, be permitted to sell cannabis. Yeah. And this you can just take out the, if it gets too confusing. Yeah. This is clearly government operations work. I would think. Yeah, we can, we'll do that. We're doing it next week. Good. All right, here, this may help y'all right here. I forgot I had this in here. Uh, so an integrated license, you'll see subsection A, existing law, allows the licensee to engage in the activities of the other five licenses, but they don't have to obtain those other five. They just get that one. Um, right now, the way that this is structured uh, under Act 164 is that the in order to have um, fees and tax revenue coming in as early as possible, um, their integrated licensees, along with small cultivators and testing labs, get licensed first um, in, uh, in, in the spring of, of 2022. And, uh, and so they are allowed to start selling to the public as soon as they can start to cultivate and, uh, and have product and and because retailers under that retail license aren't coming on until the fall. So, um, so right now, um, let's see. <clears throat> it's clarifying that there shall not be more than five total integrated licenses one for each registered dispensary. I think that's like an, a wayward underline there on line 21, but I'll double check. And then upon compliance with all the application procedures, the board right now it says shall in, issue an integrated license to the applicant and this changes it to May. So it's discretionary as to whether or not the board uh, it has to issue an integrated license to a dispensary if they qualify. So they might qualify with, with everything, but it would still be up to the board about whether or not to issue that license. Um, I'll just mention there that if they don't uh, issue those licenses, then there will be a substantial financial impact, just so you know. Um, Section three for social equity. Uh, so when reporting to the General Assembly um, with regard to section five, which we just went through, the control board is to consider reduced licensing fees for individuals who have been disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. So that's supposed to be, they're supposed to consider that and as part of their recommendations back to you uh, for April 1st. Subsection B, uh, 
not later than April 1st, uh, General Assembly is to receive a proposal from the Cannabis Control Board for a low interest loan fund to be made available to persons who have been historically disproportionately impacted by prohibition um, and who seek to participate in the regulated cannabis market. Can I ask uh, maybe the yep. sponsor, is this to be a revolving fund? Um, meaning that the legislature would put in less money as it goes forward, or maybe um, ultimately it would be self-sustaining, or how is that? Uh, well, don't have a recipient of the question, I guess. Um, Senator Sear. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I don't know that I can answer that question. Okay. I believe that um, it's a placeholder. All right. Um, we we well, will get, um, be, I believe be uh, Senator Rahm's amendment may address some of this. Can I, can I ask a question also, it's Alice. Yeah. With regard to line nine in section three, is there uh, guidelines for how it determines who historically has been disproportionately impacted or is that defined someplace else too? How is it determined? That is not defined in the existing law or in this bill. Um, the whole approach was that, so those terms were used in Act 164 uh, on the assumption that the Cannabis Control Board was going to be through adoption of rules, be identifying a process for how they determine who has been disproportionately impacted. How does one know that rules will do that? I mean, is that in, your, in the other bill that says that they will determine that? There are rulemaking requirements around things that are related to that. It doesn't say specifically you have to outline your process for identifying those individuals, but it's, I think it's kind of uh, implicit within the things that they have to determine um, for licensing and some of the programming. I mean, could, might this not apply without some clear guidelines, which maybe some, there may be, I don't know what there is, but anyway, could it not mean that, um, you know, persons who have been arrested several times for possession in the past in Vermont here that um, they be the ones who are given priority. And, and I don't mean, I, I understand the piece about race and that piece that people are desiring to get in there, but I'm just wondering what about the, you know, just folks who have been in, arrested multiple times on some ground similar to this, are they? I think, I think it does contemplate that those may be people who are included. I think it depends on how it's further, how it's further defined and implemented by the board. You, of course, the legislature can choose to identify, to take that and to further refine that or change the term or anything like that. But that's the term that's used and it's not, it's not given any specificity. But there are people who think that it should encompass people who have records for cannabis offenses. Um, right, seems to be. Mm -hmm. can, can I just throw in something here is that both Massachusetts and Illinois are the kind of the ones that are used um, as models for this. And they had very, very good um, written rules and legislation, but the implementation of the, in both cases was pretty much a disaster. And so I think that whenever we um, get to this point of having recommendations and Maybe it has to be <clears throat> not by rule, but by um, going somehow through the legislature. And I'm not sure how that would look, but, but what we have learned is that they, it sounds good on paper, but when they started looking into it, they really were not getting to the um, impacted communities at all because of the way it was implemented. Um, I have a question. And again, maybe for Senator Sears, uh, in, in the thinking about how this is going to work, just building on what Jeanette just said, clearly here, this was kicked to the control board 
to think about, prepare a recommendation that would come back and it was April, but now, you know, maybe it's, it's June that, that they do that. We're out of session. Is, is there, is that the preferred method to use the cannabis control board to send recommendations or was that a placeholder and we might think about doing this, this session? I think frankly that what Senator White just said is, is this is probably a placeholder to figure out how to deal with the racial disparities and other disparities in the, in the system that um, the Illinois has been held up as a model, yet implementation has been um, difficult there. So hopefully learning from that, but. Um, no, I get, I get that. I'm, I, just... I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, the, what, other than that, I mean, we were, we were drafting a bill to try to respond to the governor's veto, uh, non-veto message. A strange message um, to be sure that, you know, you usually don't write, I'm letting this become law, but this is wrong with it. This is wrong with it. Mm -hmm. So that was part of it. But then as we learned more about Illinois and um, other states, um, how you implement it is key. I guess my question is, is really how important do we consider the consideration and recommendation from the control board? Is that something we definitely well, want? I, my guess we... is as we get testimony from witnesses from those uh, who represent those disproportionately, with the word disproportionately impacted, as well as others, I think it'll become clearer what some of their goals are and, and help us to fashion this. Um, but I think um, it's a tall order to do this over Zoom. Quite frankly, mm -hmm. it's it's. it's I find when something is, um, we know it's not working elsewhere, even despite their best efforts to put something together. And, um, that's, I think, part of the reason for leaving things to the control board that may have, but in other times, have been more direct. More direct. And now that the control board has slowed down, this makes it a little more. But I think this is obviously an important section. I don't know that that answers your question. Well, I, I, I understood you to be saying we'd figure it out as we go. Not pretty much, yeah. Is it okay to move to section four? Please. Okay, so section four, um, this lays out the implementation of the licensing. And um, you'll see that, like, as I already mentioned, the, um, the first uh, applications are, are, uh, are in April of next year. Um, you'll see here on subdivision A3 um, that if an integrated, if a dispensary obtains an integrated license and begins selling cannabis and cannabis products to the public, um, and they would be doing this prior to the retailers obtaining their license in the fall of 2022, that between August 1st and October 1st, when the other retailers come online, 25% of the cannabis flower that would be sold by that integrated licensee has to be obtained from a licensed small cultivator. So as I mentioned earlier, small cultivators, testing labs and integrated licensees get licensed first. And so those small cultivators could then um, sell their product to the integrated licensees for sale to the public. Section five uh, is not later than July 1st for this year, criminal justice Council uh, is to report to Justice Oversight regarding funding for 
the requirements um, that on or before the end of this year, all law enforcement receive a minimum of 16 hours of A-RIDE training. That's, and so that was a provision that was in uh, Act 164. And so that's just kind of having them follow up and update you uh, regarding that. That My guess is that you could probably find that out before then, but um, because I know that this is something that they were planning on doing anyway. Um, so that might be actually in the budget proposal now, I'm not sure. In section six, so you recall that with regard to the excise tax, there's a 14% excise tax on cannabis that is sold to the public and uh, cannabis products as well. And that money, there's a 30% of that money goes to substance misuse prevention. Um, that was in session law in Act 164. Section six repeals that as session law and section seven establishes that same language in statute within um, Title 32. So you'll see there just a reiteration that 30% goes there. There's a cap of $10 million. Um, Subsection B is that if there's any um, unexpended money at the end of the fiscal year, the balance is carried forward and only used for the purpose of funding substance misuse prevention programming in the subsequent fiscal year. One of the things, and I, it's been a while since I've looked at that non-veto message, but one of the things uh, I think on the governor's list was ensuring that that money didn't get raided or something like that. Or, um, and as you know, you can't, um, you can't uh, restrict a future general assembly, um, but this is the language we came up with and just saying that, you know, there's money that if there's any money left in the fund, it carries forward, so it should be there. Subsection C is any appropriation carried forward shall be in addition to the revenues allocated and not a substitute. So just Michelle, a there. Yep. Is that the exact same language that section as what was in law? No, it's tweaked a little bit, and I'll pull. I'll pull up the the. Um, that would be useful if you could redline it or something. Yep. Yeah, and I can have. Um, this was there was a long discussion between kind of the money attorneys in my office and Senator Sears about looking about how to tweak that back and forth, and so if you want to talk kind of a little more in depth in this, I might have one of them come in and chat with you about it. Even, yeah, if, even if you could just give us the existing language alongside this. Sure. Um, that, that would yeah. help. Yep, yeah, I will, as you uh, can see for folks following along, it's section nine of Act 164 and I'll just excerpt it and email it to the committee. Okay. Sounds good. Um, I, I think we modeled it after. We just went through something similar with the uh, justice reinvestment funds. How to make sure that money is reinvested. No problem. Um, and then the bill is effective on passage. That's the easiest section. Yeah. <laughs> um, Peggy, if you want to notify, uh, are there any further questions for um, Michelle on this? Uh, walk through. Um, we have, there are groups who are interested in making significant changes to the act that we passed last year under S54. Um, and I, we will be hearing from them. Um, and as I said earlier, the part of the dilemma is how you kind uh, of do all this while we're meeting remotely and then getting a house that's pretty well firm and not making significant change to this um, move. So it'll be uh, interesting to say the least. But I thought the questions that the committee asked were excellent. I may receive a call that I have to take. Um, okay. Um, but we'll see. All right. So, um, Senator Sears? 
Yeah. So just so that you know, um, GovOps is going to be um, working with the LCT around the, the opt-in, opt-out, and also the language on the what should be on the um, on the bill. I mean, on the okay. warning. And, and the the deadline is uh, that we put in here presents a real problem because they won't even have rules until June now, or even if they had rules in April, they'd be putting something on the ballot that they had no idea what it was going to be because they have to have their warnings done by January 25th. So, and they wouldn't be having any rules or any uh, rollout or anything. And so we're looking at that. I just got a text from Senator Pearson that Bennington, Brandon, Brattleboro, Burlington, Danville, Linden, Millbury, Montpelier, Fowl, Richmond, St. John's, Bury, Stratford, Stratton, Waterbury, and Minuski all have ballot items. And probably the village of Bellows Falls. They just didn't list that. They may, they have, the village hasn't done their warning yet. Oh, okay. The town has, but the village hasn't. Oh, I see. They're separate. What is the oh, what? what is the question they're allowed to have on the ballot right now? Well, the one in Bennington has uh, whether or not retail sales should be allowed, and whether integrated licenses should be allowed. Oh, so that has that integrated license language. It has two separate ballot, two separate ballot articles. I don't know about the other towns. No, but I'm thinking they. The person on the street who comes in to vote and looks at the integrated language, you know what? What the heck is that? Right? Are they yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> and they can't have more I have integrated to take licenses. A call. I, I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. Um. So I assume, unless there are other questions, we're moving to Senator Rom's amendment. Is that uh, okay, um, Senator Rom? And do we have it, or we do? It's up on the uh, committee's documents page. Okay. And but can it be put on the screen too, please? Sure. Uh, I, I'll do it. Okay. Um, Senator Rom, welcome. Uh, Senator Sears had to step away for just a moment. Um, but if you'd like to uh, introduce before we do a walkthrough, uh, feel free. Sure. Uh, thank you so much to the chairman and vice chairman and uh, Senate Judiciary for having me for the record, Senator Keisha Rahm from Chittenden County. Um, this is a bill in, uh, in not an amendment form and in somewhat early stages as I was gathering input and feedback from the organizations named within the amendment, which include the Racial Justice Alliance, um, Migrant Justice, and the NAACP chapters of the state. Um, the idea being that, as you all know well, particularly because you were in session in the aftermath of the murders of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, the um, Fi f shots being fired into the back of a man in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and a number of other um, unfortunate and untimely events often involving um, the killing of black people by the police, there have been renewed efforts to help communities define public safety for themselves and work through those issues um, as a community. This all came in the middle of a pandemic where many municipalities have been depleted in terms of their access to resources for big picture conversations. Um, but we know that we in Vermont have not been immune in any way to conversations about policing and what public safety looks like for communities of color. This has come up very specifically in places like Burlington, Winooski, Virgens, Newport, Rutland, Bennington, and the list goes on. Um, and so the idea behind this bill is that it would help resource those communities to have their own conversations about what public safety looks like. Um, I you know, am often called on as a professional facilitator 
um, to help with these conversations. And one of the first things I say, I wanna be very clear about this, is have you worked to find resources to give stipends or give financial support in some way to the people who would need to be at the table in your community to have this conversation? So those who bring these uh, issues up and try to help bring people to the table are often struggling to balance their um, access to financial resources and their ability to earn a paycheck with their ability to stipend or resource the people who need to be part of the conversation and be heard. And so I have worked with a lot of municipalities to encourage them to find the money to help pay those folks to be part of this conversation. Otherwise, what happens are things you might see in places like Burlington and elsewhere where they're only having half of the conversation. They may be talking about wanting to reduce their police force or have uh, less resources go to their police department or law enforcement. But the other half of the conversation that's really important to communities of color and other marginalized folks is that they also have resources so they can figure out what public safety does mean for their community. They still want safe communities and they still want the ability um, to be able to resource those conversations and make sure that they're all able to come together and sit at the table with law enforcement, with the social work community, with mental health practitioners, with other social service providers to figure out what actual public, with educators to figure out what actual public safety looks like for their communities. So this would provide small grants for those communities to be able to do that work. And the small grants um, would be administered by the Criminal Justice Council with the three groups that I mentioned before, Migrant Justice, uh, the Racial Justice Alliance and the NAACP chapters. The leaders of those organizations are aware of the language in this bill and they're still reviewing it. Um, but those who have responded to me, which is uh, everyone who is it's at least one person named in those th three organizations um, has indicated that they would like to continue this conversation and they do see a place for um, generating resources for com community-based organizations to lead these conversations themselves. So that's the general intent of the bill and what it's designed to do. Um, it, it starts with 20% of the cannabis excise tax going to these uh, conversations. That is by all means just a starting point. Um, I don't you know, know exactly what the conversations look like about when revenue will come in. It was why I was trying to listen a little bit as you started your testimony before I went into committee. Um, but you know, I, I, would, I would characterize that as starting high and recognizing that there are demands for a lot of different things for this revenue, that there are general fund pressures that we're trying to support with these. But I would really argue that municipalities deserve to have this conversation in a way where everyone can come to the table with facilitation, with support, with equal partnership. And otherwise, what we're going to see is a lot of people um, on a collision course about what they want to see happen with their law enforcement agencies and with the future of their communities. And they don't have the resources available to them to, re to reconcile what's happened with the war on drugs, what's happened with the um, overcriminalization of cannabis, and now the aftermath of that, where people are trying to right size their law enforcement and right size their um, public safety infrastructure alongside conversations about what true public safety um, and community led efforts should look like within their neighborhoods and communities. So that essentially, I believe is the, uh, the bill. And I would look to Michelle Childs to see if I missed anything really important in the draft um, and happy to answer questions. Thanks very much. Um, Michelle, do you wanna uh, walk us through? Sure. Um, I, so Peggy, do you, can you move it up a little bit? Sorry, I guess I should, probably should have shared it. Um, so, uh, so section one is just a defining municipality for purposes of uh, this provision with regard to the cannabis taxes in Title 32. Um, you'll see on subsection A is the existing language that is in um, Act 164 with regard to the 30% and the $10 million cap. So that's like comes off, so off the 14%, 30% um, comes off the top and goes to substance mis misuse prevention. So subsection B at the top of page two, um, and that's where you have the language 20% 
of the revenues um, shall be used uh, by the Criminal Justice Council in consultation with the Racial Justice Alliance, Migrant Justice, and National Association for the Advance Advancement of Colored People for grants to municipalities in Vermont to engage in community-based process related to policing and public safety. Um, the Can I ask a question about that? Mm -hmm. it, it strikes me that I think there's only 60 municipalities in the state that have police forces, and I may be off. Um, the rest rely either on sheriffs or state police, and in some rare cases, constables. Um, is this basically for, uh, how would we deal with those other municipalities that don't have their own police force? I don't think it specifies necessarily that they have to have their own police force. Um, it could be a community where they're having a conversation about what public safety looks like, regardless of what kind of interactions they've had with the Vermont State Police. Um, but, you know, the many of the communities I named that are having this conversation around the state um, do have a police force, however small. Yeah, yeah that, that that's my only, um, that, that's one area that we should look at. Yeah, this language could certainly be massaged so that it makes it clear it's eligible for all uh, communities who want to have a conversation about equitable public safety, regardless of having their own police force. Well, one of the things that frustrates me in, in many cases is we have communities that use a high amount of our state police time <clears throat> that have chosen not to fund their own police department receiving um, the state police, and then we have other communities that have their own police departments that are paying a lot out of the property to actually fund those police departments. And I just, I, I'm concerned about those that don't, that have large communities, you know, maybe over 2,500 people, 3,500 people that don't have their own police. Mm -hmm. That's a fair point. But anyway, um, I didn't know if you wanted to address it further. No, no, it's just that's one area I would think we want to look at. Should this bill come to us? I don't know. It's hard to tell. I mean, I was surprised in some ways that the cannabis bill even came to us because it's got government ops, got economic development, and taxing. At any rate. Seems like we're the marijuana committee that is the starting for cannabis. I get it. It's just like earn time. I got to remember that we changed the name of things. Mm. <clears throat> well, and and as someone serving on the other two committees you named, you know, certainly um, yeah. it, it's just a conversation that's come up. You know, I feel like in a lot of realms. So I appreciate you you taking time to hear about this. Yeah. Um, other questions. Senator Rahm? Um, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I can continue to let um, Michelle walk through the bill, but I was yeah. listening. Okay. I apologize if I interrupted. <laughs> no, no, no. Go ahead, Michelle. Continue. So just on, on Section 2, as uh, Senator Rahm mentioned, the grants are to be prioritized for communities that are looking to transition away from kind of uh, traditional police force policing and looking for alternatives uh, in their programming. Section three is the repeal of the, just like what you have in S225, is the repeal of the uh, session law that's currently in subsection A that you can see the language. And so, uh, Philip, uh, the language that's in subsection A is what's currently in session law with regard to the 30% uh, for substance misuse. Um, so this is just kind of following the same kind of idea as S25, which is to put it into statute. And certainly if you wanted to uh, adopt this proposal, we can just drop it into those sections that you already have with regard to the funding. So, um, and then the last section on section four is just uh, tweaking the effective dates of Act 164 because you're changing the, the session law into the statutory provision. Um, can you go down a little further? Yep. Thank you, section five. Um, 
and this is again, just kind of belts and suspenders. So where you have it mentioned in other places, the 30% about the transfers made um, for the substance misuse is it adds the 20% transfer for the use for the um, policing initiatives. Peggy, can you go down to the next page? There you go. And then um, page four, just the se uh, section six is the effective dates, um, just that the effective date section and the repeal and the amendments to the effective date section in Acts 60 164 take effect on passage. And then the other provisions would take effect on March 1st, 2022, which is when they start to have the potential for, uh, for sales. And that's when all the other tax provisions take effect in 164. Thank you. Any other questions? Pretty clear, I guess. Thank you, Senator Rahm. Appreciate you being, joining us over here. Thanks so much for giving me time on this and uh, look forward to future discussion. Thank you. Yeah, and um, we're going to have discussions with um, various other folks next week sometime. Um, want to tune in or talk with them and we'll see what their views are. One of them is Mark Hughes, so I, I know you're familiar with Mark. His, uh, efforts here. Yeah appreciated and will watch the tapes after and spoke with Mark just this morning since he's, you know, named, named in this piece. And I know there's a lot of efforts to try and uh, do some, some repair to what's happened in the war on drugs and the way it's affected low-income communities and communities of color. So appreciate mm -hmm. your attention to those issues. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other um, Hard to tell where to go from here, to be honest with you. Michelle, uh, there have been a number of bills introduced or in drafting right now, as I understand it. Um, do you have, have other? You, have you mean other around plan? cannabis? Yeah, yeah. I have, I have my 2% um, of the 14% for two municipalities in lieu of local fees. That's a separate bill. Yeah, it's separate. Yeah, you said you were looking for that. Dick, yes. um, I, I, Senator Bruce. at the risk of uh, repeating myself, uh, um, it, it, I'm still not clear on, do we, do we feel that the Cannabis Control Board should weigh in on these things before we do, or should we rather give them language if we can create it this session and have them implement it. Um, because I know that part of the work Jeanette's been doing is to find the most qualified people to be making the decisions. So it seems like a fair question, should they be giving us the input before we act? Um, Which I, don't, I don't know how you all feel about that. Well, um, I think you're right in many ways, but I think we need to provide direction on the social equity issues and some, and particularly uh, some of the other issues that uh, I don't think that they're necessarily gonna provide us that direction on those. There are some issues regarding integrated licenses, cultivation and other stuff, at least we should hear whether we make those changes or not um, is up to this committee or whether or not I'm serious. Um, but uh, I think on the social equity piece, which is um, touches in this particular bill and, and in the amendment that Senator Brown just presented, um, I think we need to give at least the very least direction to the control board. Uh, if we wait for them, um, the session probably will be over before they really get up and going. Mm -hmm. um, since, I mean, we, you know, the timeline that Michelle was talking about isn't obviously isn't that. So 
I don't, um, I don't know how many, I think we'll have to pick and choose the issues and see where we're at on some of them. Some of them I agree, we, we should probably wait for the control board to weigh in. Um, advertising, that's a problem. Um, we, we Maybe we should ask the attorney general for information sooner rather than later. But again, just getting a bill through Senate, the House and signed by the governor Senator Nitka. Is there, is there another board that has similar powers in place right now that could maybe offer some guidance? Oh, I don't um, about this. Well, liquor well, control board. But but they they weren't responsible for a set. This is a brand new, as was has yeah. been pointed out, it's a brand new industry, a brand new, uh, and it's an industry in a in an odd position because it's legal and not legal and federally. Uh, I mean, it's, I, I don't think that there is a similar board that um, deals with this setting up like this. I mean, are there other boards with, which have that much power or, you know, is this totally new too? That, that's what I was responding to. The liquor control oh. board does, does have a great deal of power over, mm -hmm. um, you know, oh. licensing, advertising, the, the whole nine yards. But I think Jeanette's right. This marks out new territory. We're, we're actually asking them, at least in what, what passed, we're asking them to weigh in on issues of social equity and other things right. that we would never put in front of the Liquor Control Board. No. Um, I think that we, in terms of a couple, a couple of the things here, advertising and social equity certainly are two of them in my mind, that we need to set with advertising, maybe we actually even need to do something. But with um, the social equity part, I think we need to set some broad parameters. We need to give them more direction than we've given without getting into such minutia that we fall apart doing it. But we need to, we need to give them, um, I mean, just looking at what's happened in other states about the implementation, and they're being asked to implement this pretty quickly. So along with everything else they're being asked to implement, um, I think we need to give them more direction. Okay. I think so too. I mean, I think if you're writing the law, you ought to help them. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. the what are the problems that other states have faced in terms of, is it the legislative or the bureaucracy that's caused the problem with the social equity pieces in Illinois and Massachusetts? My understanding is that it's the, the implementation of it, that the, the, the rule, everything was written uh, with good intention and made sense. But when they started um, implementing it, uh, just an example, um, it's supposed to, uh, in Illinois, for example, one of the things, I think it was Illinois or Michigan, one of the things they found was that um, it was supposed to be uh, special grants and funds. There was a um, fund established to help people who had been um, disproportionately impacted. And when they, so they took the applications and the application was there and people checked off and everything. And when they looked further into it, they found that there were some very wealthy um, people and very wealthy um, businesses that were getting these funds that sh should not have qualified at all. They happened to be either women or minority owned, or in some cases, the company would put a woman or a person of color in a position saying that they were actually the owner or the, the person that was running it. And in looking further back, they were just kind of this um, figurehead. So it was those kinds of things that, um, and I'm sure there are tons more examples. I, I can't say what they are right now, but yeah. those are those are two that- well, I think, well, but it does raise an important issue though, um, both on the social equity front, but also on the integrated licenses. How are we, doing things that would avoid having, you know, for lack of a better term, the Philip Morris of, of uh, cannabis um, under an integrated license. 
uh, that that was the fear goes all the way back to our initial hearings on legalization and so forth. Here are many people. That so I think if we write the equipment to take over, and that's one of the fears of the uh, of the medical uh, of the medical cannabis uh, groups is that they are um, corporate. You know, they may not be as big here as they are in other states, but um, that the corporate weed. Remember that discussion yeah, in our yeah. first went around the state on yeah. this bill was corporate weed, and I. Um, so how are we? How do we make sure we avoid that in both the social equity piece and then whatever we do with integrated licenses? That to me is one of the most critical things if we haven't already taken care of it. That's really what you're talking about. I just want to add one more one more issue that came out is that <laughs> when they were looking at the communities that were disproportionately affected, one of the things that didn't come up was um, rural poor who had been disproportionately affected. And, and that wasn't kind of even put into the mix that and so you have a lot of um, rural poor kids who were um, were disproportionately affected, and that people were thinking mainly around people of color and women. And so there there are a lot of issues here that need to be dealt with. Yeah. Back, back to um, Alice's point from before, or I think it was Alice's point. If someone has actually been brought up on charges and convicted, regardless of what group they're in, during the war on drugs, and without um, giving away any of Joe's secrets, Joe has told his own story with getting, uh, getting charged with marijuana in his younger life. Is that enough? Um, or, or would we say you were charged and convicted maybe more than once, but you're not a part of the community that has been disproportionately affected. That seems odd to me too, where we would say to a group of people who can prove that they were targeted by the system under the war on drugs, but wouldn't be eligible for what we're talking about. So I don't know how I feel about that piece. Well, I mean, if you go back to Nixon and his war on the hippies. Right. That was part of his refusal back in the sixties to uh, legalize. I think he had a commission, I can't think of the name of the commission that looked at it. <clears throat> um, and I, I know the tapes have been revealed his, you know, his, you know, the war on the hippies, I guess. Well, so I, you know, that's, those are folks who were, uh, uh, you know, also uh, mm -hmm. impacted, but we've, you know what, Senator, uh, Senator Michelle. I just wanted to uh, remind folks that you did pass expungement last year, and right. that as of right now, even though it's going to take the court some time to actually go through and just, and 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 issue those expungement orders, that as of right now, anybody who has a prior conviction for possession of under two ounces. Um, can can say legally that they do not have a conviction. And so those misdemeanor, so that is out. Also, you have an Act 164 provision that says when, um, when considering applicants uh, for, either, uh, for either a license or for employment at a licensed establishment that nonviolent drug offenses are automatic disqualifiers for either employment or for, for a, receiving a license. And so part one of the things that the board is to do is um, establish criteria for how they assess people's criminal backgrounds mm -hmm. um, in terms of what might be disqualifying offenses, maybe some type of corporate embezzlement. You know, you get say, nope, we're not gonna let you in to have a cannabis license for that, whatever, but they're developing that. So I just wanted to mention those two things and how they might factor in. But if I zero back in on something that Senator Nick here, I think is the one I mentioned it. We go back to page, put the glasses on. Page five of bill is introduced, S25. 
uh, Social Equity, Section 3B. It uses on line 13, um, uh, available to individuals who historically have been disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition who seek to participate in the regulated cannabis market. <clears throat> How do we define that? That's a thought that's part of the conversation. Yeah. Um, and a critical piece. Well, that that's an interesting thing about Senator Rahm's bill. If I understood it, the money, 20%, is diverted to um, criminal justice group, which then gives the money to municipalities. Um, so it, at least conceivably, depending on what the municipalities conceive of doing with the money, it might not go to these communities. Um, right. it, it might just be used to facilitate civic discussion. So yeah. then... It I mean, might be I, used to embed mental health workers in police departments that would be dealing with Right, or, the or in, public of that in the version of, of uh, S25 that you have now, it's, it's direct economic benefit to people in those communities in the form of the cheaper loans and the cheaper licenses. And I'm sure, well, I shouldn't speak for her, but I imagine Senator Rahm would be fine with those provisions remaining if hers was added. Um, but I, I was surprised because 20% is a lot. You know, that, that might be three or $4 million a year that would be in effect subsidizing civic conversations. It's, that's a lot to think about every year putting into funding civic talk that goes on now for free. I honestly yeah. believe that every estimate of income um, has been really low ball. Mm. I believe the income will be much higher than what the expectations have been as this <coughs> sales are. So, I agree. Yeah. But do we anywhere, anywhere in statute define disproportionate impact? No. By anything? No. That's why I think we have to have some parameters around it. And I don't, because it's individuals who have been disproportionately impacted, not communities who have been, or groups of people, it's individuals. Well, I mean, but, and one but, of the, one of the um, proposals, and I don't remember if it was Illinois, Michigan, Massachusetts, or Vermont, said that anyone whose parents were arrested on drug charges falls into this category. I, I, I mean, I think we need to put some parameters around around what historically uh, dis, dis, uh, proportionately impacted means. I agree and that that would be some of the subject as we begin to continue the conversation with others mm -hmm. uh, during testimony. I think that, but I don't, I think if we leave it, if we left it like this, Cannabis Control Board to uh, report how, how this would all be made. I. Um, and quite frankly, low interest loan, done, I mean, um, no interest loan in some, for some folks might be the right thing to do. Um, outright grants for some folks might be the right thing to do to help them get their businesses started. So I, I know this is an ignorant question and I'll, I'll pose it to Senator White because I think she's most up on the, on the data but a couple of times we've thrown women in to the um, discussion of disproportionate impact. That seems counterintuitive to me, um, given that women are charged and incarcerated at such low rates with regard to men. Is it, is it provable with data that women have been disproportionately impacted by marijuana conviction? I, I, think, I think not, and in Vermont, my guess is that the the community, the two communities that have been the mostly mostly impacted, um, and certainly communities of color, but um, have been, I'm not sure in Vermont. I would say that the in Vermont the most disproportionately impacted communities are the um, rural kind of upper 
rural poor and yeah. the hippies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those are the those are the ones that I mean, come down here to um, Wyndham County and look at what happened at Wyndham College uh, or any place else. I mean, you know, so so I think we have to we have to be really careful about what we mean here. Mm -hmm. and, and what we're setting up and what kind of preferences we're giving to people and why we're giving it to them about the impact from um, the, the systems in Vermont that have affected them. Understood, but I do think if you look at the, when it, the term disproportionate and you look at traffic stop data, there's no question that based upon on race, clearly they are disproportionately impacted by traffic stops. By traffic stops. Resulted, resulted in marijuana charges or convictions. So it seems like- so I, I don't think, I, I just don't see any, <clears throat> I don't have the data off the top of my head, but everything that we, we saw back in the, a few years ago, but I do agree that you know definitely there were um, the groups that were targeted. As I said you go back to Nixon. That's why it's important to me. Historically, have been disproportionately impacted. I think that that means to me that people, persons of color. Historically, look if you really what does historically mean, but if you're certainly looking at historically, certainly back um, in the 60s and 70s, as Jeanette said, that was you know hippies, or you know, they weren't all hippies, but certainly there were people targeted then, and we didn't have much of a black population then, or people of color, certainly some, and, and certainly, but in more recent years, you're right, it's been in more recent, what's that, say 15, 20 years that so many people have been stopped. Um, well, that's, that's when we have the data. Yeah. It's sort of like if we didn't ask the question, we don't know what the answer is, but there's no reason to believe that 30 years ago it wasn't worse or the same. Well, In other words, <clears throat> even though we didn't have the data on traffic stops 30 years ago, it's safe to assume that things were just as bad as but there were a smaller population of people in the state, a smaller uh, population of people. In but I, you, you remember the Irisburg incident? The what? Irisburg. Oh, yes, yeah. I mean, there have been a number of those. Those are way back when. Yeah. I don't know the Iris, Irisburg. What is well, I'll get the details mixed up, but there was a, a person of color who moved there. I believe he was a minister. Minister. Oh. And the people targeted him, and I can't remember all the details. But was this the one that got turned into stranger in the kingdom? Yeah, Howard Frank Mosier. Yeah, Mosier. Yeah, and it was a, uh, it was one of those times in the, you know, we think of Vermont as being racially progressive, um, but we weren't. Uh, but the, that was in the '60s, wasn't it? Irisburg? I don't know. I think so. I think it was, I think it was early 60s. Yeah. He was shot at and other things. Uh, and it was a biracial marriage too. So can remember. I just comment yeah. on... Anyway, all, my only point is that we, race issues date way back. You know? Oh, they do. Mm-hmm. So can I comment on the yep. amendment that was just yes, proposed to us? Yep. So in general, I think that um, communities are having these discussions, but um, I, and I support maybe some funds going to uh, communities who are trying to have these discussions and need some support. However, as with every other um, issue that has asked to have money um, 
directed from this fund to specific issues, higher education, K through 12, um, anything else, I, I, do, I do not believe we should be doing that. I, I just think that this is, um, that that should be an issue that's left to the um, appropriations committee to figure out where money is needed. And we will be taking testimony on this. I had not seen this before, but because um, government operations deals with the, with the council and the makeup of the council and with law enforcement. And I was very nervous about one of the phrases in there that said that they would- it would You're be on the given, amendment now? Yeah, it would be given priority to communities who are transitioning away from policing. And I, that, um, since we deal with law enforcement- This is a draft, I assume they meant related to traditional policing. Well, it doesn't say that. I know, but this yeah. is a draft. But I, anyway. It's like, any, um, it's like any draft. I, I would suggest they use the term traditional policing. Well, I don't even know what that means, but. Well. Can I just tag on to what Jeanette said? Yep. Um, I, I, uh, I'm glad to hear you mention higher education. Um, that's, that's a personal belief of mine that, you know, the state is on the hook now for 50 plus million a year. And that's unsustainable going forward unless we plug in some new funding source. So um, my hope is that ultimately that's the decision that appropriations and this committee and the Senate and the House make. Um, we're going we're gonna to have a, a series of requests that come into different committees for it. So mm -hmm. I think it does make sense to have one, one committee make the decisions. Um, I, I, in this case, I have to say, I like the language in S20, S25 that we walked through first, yes. the revolve, revolving loan fund and reduced license fees. I like that better than what's in Senator Rahm's amendment, because it seems to me to speak to the issue, which is helping members of disproportionately impacted communities take advantage of this new market. Whereas Senator Rahm's is a useful, it's, it's a useful discussion and maybe resources should go to it, but I don't, it's a, maybe not a separate discussion, but it's somewhat different than mm -hmm. getting resources to those communities. Because as I say, right now, it's, it's gonna wind up in the form of grants that go to municipalities. And it may well be that people of color and other impacted communities don't see any of it. Um, so that's, that's just a first blush on the two side by side. I may, in this committee may, after further testimony decide that this Bill belongs in the government operations today. <laughs> but I, your, your should we talk to the chair of the government operations <laughs> committee about that? Well, I she like, want to think about that over the uh, over the week. Would, she would be happy to think about that, but I do think that this committee should um, at least have at least give some consideration and some direction to um, the parameters around the social equity I agree. And, and the advertising, because that's a legal, yep. that's a legal issue. So whoever has the bill, I don't care who has the bill, we're going to take testimony on some of it. We can bring it in here. Or well, if you could provide Michelle between now and the next time we meet the language from the original S54, or whatever passed the Senate on advertising, I think we did a great job. And I think we had it covered so that it's constitutional. And I think the House, mm -hmm. with its insistence, um, took it. And I, I think that language is probably fine to, to send again. Why reinvent the wheel? Mm -hmm. I can send you what um, passed out of the Senate, and then you'll recall that what happened in the House is that um, I know it was a floor was amendment. Just... Floor amendment said right. no advertising. Right, but the House GovOps took what you did and just built that out a little bit and sent that. Yeah. 
four, and then the band was there. So I'll send, well, you, send, send us I'll both. I'll send you both. Send us both, and I, but I think that would be an easy um, solution to the quandary and then send it back to them. And the House actually agreed, most of a l number of House members I know, agreed. but then they. Well, yeah. <coughs> so very if you have those floor. two, if you have that language, is the two uh, proposals from the Senate and the House Gov Ops Committee, and then you had the AG in, maybe you could do the work that the board would be doing with the AG's office. You could do it now. And Why don't we schedule that for a few minutes next week when we take this up again, Peggy, to have uh, Michelle get the language to the Attorney General and we take it up. And I mean, I realize there'll be other things to talk about on S25, but that seems to be the simplest one. I'm pretty comfortable with either one. So can I just uh, correct what I said that I think Philip misinterpreted just a little bit there? Um, when I said that I thought the Appropriations Committee should decide, I don't think the Appropriations Committee should, should um, set aside funds from this fund, this revenue to specific issues other than the one we've already agreed to, but that the Appropriations Committee should year by year try to figure out where, where the money is needed at, from the general fund, and this should go into the general funds. It, it might be to higher education, but it shouldn't be um, earmarked for that in, in this revenue source is my belief. Okay, fair, fair enough. I, I, uh... I'm just thinking that for, and, and to go back to the state colleges, they're in a position, they're in a kind of in existentially precarious position. And the fact that we've been bridging them is one thing. If, even if we were to make a pledge every year to, to increase the amount, I, I think that's less useful to them personally than if we dedicated a funding stream, not yeah. that that couldn't be diverted, but, um, but it's, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I hear you and that's uh, gonna be a, a robust discussion from 14 or 15 different angles when mm -hmm. we ultimately get to it. Right. Well, um, when we take this up again next week, um, I, the first item would be the advertising and then we'll hear from some testimony from others. And Michelle, you'll come to our... I'm sorry, I'll reach out to David Schur about the advertising. I'll give him a buzz today and give him a heads up and send him the language. Yep. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Senator White. Where no, you'll be coming to our committee too. Okay, pleasure. <laughs> well, well, we're done a little early, but 10 minutes early. That gives me time to <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do the next thing before the caucus. All right. Thank, Thank you all very much. We'll see you tomorrow morning at